There is a lot to talk about with these new AM5 motherboards, including the fact that there are now two different options when it comes to X670 and even B650 motherboards, the E or extreme variants, so let's just get straight into it. The most obvious change here is that AMD is dropping its long-standing support for having easily bendable pins on the backs of their CPUs, instead moving to having them in the socket instead. Okay, jokes aside, AMD has moved from its PGA or pin grid array style chip to LGA or land grid array, much like Intel. They're calling the 1718 pin socket AM5, although they have decided to maintain cooler compatibility, although more on that later. The new socket is pretty huge. It's 18 more pins than Intel's current LJ1700 sockets, although remains square, unlike Team Blue. It uses the same swing-out retainer design as you would expect from Intel, although it's a complete just pin array, rather than Intel's approach of keeping the pins and pads away from directly under the cores themselves, with a big hole in the middle. This is just a, a flat grid with a small line in the middle to separate the two halves. The cooler compatibility is a pretty big thing, but somewhat ironically, in trying to keep everything compatible, they've made it kind of worse twice over. First off, AMD has always provided a backplate with its motherboards. It's a great feature, and they haven't stopped with this one. The problem comes if you use a cooler that decided to not use AMD's provided backplate, because now you have no other option. The socket actuator mechanism, the, the retainer sort of clip itself, the, the metal piece on the front of the board that holds the chip in, is bolted to the same backplates they expect your cooler to use. Sounds great, right? Well, like I said, if you want to use a different backplate, good luck installing your chip if you can't hold the thing down. If you need to use a different backplate for your cooler, you will need an adapter kit for that cooler. The other problem with the cooler compatibility is something that Der Bauer talked about in his great delidding video you should definitely go check out, which is that AMD decided to maintain the same Z height, as in how high the top of the chip is off of the motherboard. This again sounds great, right? I mean, it means that you don't need an adapter kit for your cooler, unless you can't mount it, but you know, you don't need to change the height of the cooler to make it fit. Except that means the IHS, the integrated heat spreader, the, the metal bit on top of all of the silicon, is way too thick, meaning the heat doesn't escape the chip nearly as well as it could if it had a considerably thinner IHS. This is a problem that AMD can't really fix without breaking cooler compatibility and likely launching a new socket to make it clear which chips have the higher or lower heights. We'll just have to see what AMD decides to do going forward, whether they stick with the thicker IHS and just deal with that extra heat sort of soak into the chip, or whether they do make a change earlier than we might expect. Something else that's new is the DDR5 support, but unlike Intel, AMD isn't supporting both DDR4 and DDR5 on these chips, so to use these, you will have to bite the bullets and buy the slightly more expensive DDR5. I say slightly because, wow, the pricing and availability has gotten a lot better since Intel launched their 12th gen chips. Seriously, it's maybe £10 more for a DDR5 kit instead of DDR4, and that's not bad. Still, you will need new RAM if you want to use these chips, unlike Team Blue's current and upcoming options. But by far the weirdest new feature has to be this, the dual chipset chips. Now, AMD is no stranger to chiplet style designs. The very CPUs that fit in these boards have one or two core dies on board acting as one. But this is new for at least the consumer space. These are two of the same chips uh, I checked, and they're basically daisy chained together to allow for a lot more stuff to be crammed in here. 
I should start by adding that these new Ryzen 7000 series CPUs not only offer PCI Gen 5 support, but also offer an extra four lanes connected directly to the CPU compared to last gen. There are now 24 total lanes available for graphics and storage, all of which run at the new Gen 5 speeds. Damn, that is a lot of bandwidth. This generally manifests as one x16 slot connected to the CPU and up to two M.2 SSD slots also capable of Gen 5 speeds too. The CPUs then have a further four PCI Gen 4 lanes available to connect to the chipsets, which is then further split out to a varying collection of PCIe and NVMe slots, Wi-Fi, 2.5 e gig Ethernet is pretty common, and USB ports. Oh, and that's on top of the CPU, also offering, I think, up to like five USB ports, audio, and technically three if you include the USB-C DisplayPort alt mode uh, video outputs as well. But one limitation of this setup is the fact that the now two chipsets have to share the same PCI Gen 4x4 link, which, you know, if you add a single fast Gen 4x4 SSD through the chipsets, well, that would max out that connection, leaving no bandwidth for your Wi-Fi or Ethernet, SATA drives or USB ports. But with that said, if you have two PCI Gen 5 NVMe slots available direct to the CPU, why on earth would you be maxing out your chipset bandwidth with a Gen 4 SSD going through that instead? That's just, that's just beyond me. Realistically, all of this bandwidth is just way too much for most people to make use of. But AMD knows that. That's why the X670 non-E exists. That does still offer one Gen 5 NVMe SSD slots, but it only runs Gen 4 to the other CPU connected M.2 and to your graphics card. It does still use two chipset dies though, although they are a little lighter on IO generally as well. In theory, that's to help with cost, although the cheapest X670 board I can find is still an absolutely eye-watering 270 pounds. With this ASUS X670E plus Wi-Fi board I have here retailing for a heart-stopping 450. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna need a minute to 450 pounds, and this isn't even the high-end option. ASUS's Hero Board, you know, the one that used to be their middle ground, everyone should buy this board, is now 650 pounds. That's like more than most graphics cards. You can almost buy a 3080 12 gig for that. Now, part of that cost comes from the complexity of these new boards. All the PCIe lanes that they have to root, and importantly, shield, Gen 5 runs astonishingly fast. So fast, in fact, that ASUS had to put these Fizen retransmitter chips in to boost the signal and maintain its integrity over the minuscule distance from the CPU socket to the top M.2 and PCIe slots. I can't find a price quote for these chips, but they're likely alone a, a quid or two each. And, you know, just in op amps, MOSFETs, and driver ICs, ASUS is probably dropping like 50 to 100 pounds per board, and that's not, count that's not counting two AMD chipset dies, the peat sinks, the I.O. ports, and everything else. And that's just the parts cost, not designing the boards or manufacturing 8, 12, 16 layer PCBs, whatever they're using here, on top of assembling the whole thing, and then all of the margins in between. I'm not saying that it's reasonable or that you should just lay down and take it, but I can also at least somewhat appreciate where some of the cost is coming from. One of the other things that will be adding to the cost is the VRM designs. This tough board is sporting what would have been top of the line 14 plus 2 phase 70 amp VRMs just a generation or two ago, but is now middle of the road with the top end pushing 20 plus 210 amps setups instead. That's thanks to the increased 170 watt power limit up from 142 watts on the higher end chips and a bit to do with these being the extreme boards and sort of pushing higher overclocks. So all in all, these are some hefty boards, both in capabilities and in price. 
The more budget-friendly B650 and B650 e boards will be coming soon though, so if you'd rather not pay more than some people's first car for a motherboard, well, maybe we'll hold off for now. Plus, Z690 is um, inbound pretty soon too, and uh, who doesn't love a bit of competition? So that's a look at these boards. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think of the X670 boards and the Ryzen 7000 series chips? Definitely let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, if you want to check out this uh, X670, or actually uh, the general X670 boards available, I'll leave some affiliate links in the description you can check out, including ones at Amazon, and possibly ones at Overclock UK as well, if you're interested. Otherwise, if you want to see more videos like this one from me, including hopefully some testing of these 7000 series chips, and of course the Intel ones too, then do hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. You can also check out plenty of other videos on the end cards as well. Maybe check out some of my 12th gen testing to see how the, uh, the older ones compare before the new ones come in. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it really. If you want to support the channel, you can do so in a load of ways. Uh, become a YouTube member or a patron. Pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself. Like I said, there's some affiliate links in the description you can check out too. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.